I am so happy, so excited to introduce this final session of the day. I said earlier last, but definitely not least, I think everyone's been waiting for it. Um, it is our session, Wake of Solar Winds and Microsoft Exchange, Reviewing the Threat Landscape. And I'd like to introduce uh, again, Suzanne Spaulding to come and join me on stage. She doesn't need an introduction because everyone knows who she is, but she is uh, works for um, CSIS and is the um, the attache to DHS. Suzanne? Thank you, Elizabeth. Great to be back uh, with all of you. And uh, we're going to be closing out today with a discussion about the threat landscape and some of the lessons learned from recent significant cyber incidents, um, including the supply chain attack for which solar winds was one of the key vectors. Uh, the hack of on-premises Microsoft Exchange servers. And just in the last few days, we learned, of course, of another hack involving SolarWinds Orion platform vulnerabilities being exploited through Pulse Secure's VPN. And of course, there's so many more. And we've got a great panel assembled for this conversation to talk about some of the key takeaways from these hacks and what the threat landscape looks like. Uh, our panel includes Tatiana Bolton, who is Policy Director, Cybersecurity and Emerging Threat at the R Street Institute, uh, formerly at my old stomping grounds at CISA. Mark Montgomery, Executive Director of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, on which I have the honor to serve, and so I always do whatever Mark tells me to do. Uh, Brian Ware, also from my old stomping grounds uh, at CISA, but now the CEO and founder of Next5. And last but not least, Edward Yu, Supervisory Special Agent for Weapons of Mass Destruction at the FBI. And I'm going to start this afternoon by cheating a little bit. Uh, the, you know, our hosts had suggested that we keep introductions to basically current titles, but I want to give each of you a minute to tell us a little bit more about your background and how that might inform the insights that you're going to share this afternoon. And Edward, let's start with you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really a privilege to be here with all, with all of you, and thank you for uh, CMMC for the invitation. Um, I guess I'm the resident bio nerd of the panel. Um, so my, my responsibility is to look at current and emerging uh, biotechnology threats. Um, and uh, prior to joining the FBI, my background actually is um, in biochemistry, molecular biology, a recovering biochemist. I uh, spent many years um, conducting academic research in human gene therapy and then um, in the private sector doing cancer research at Amgen um, and then joined the FBI. You know, took off the lab coat, put on a badge, and been um, serving the country trying to protect us from uh, biological threat issues. So uh, happy to be here. Outstanding, happy to have you. Brian, you're next. Yeah, I, um, I'm an entrepreneur by, by background. I started a technology company uh, with some, some co-founders in the artificial intelligence and software space and ran that through venture capital and private equity and, um, and late in my career, uh, had the opportunity to, to go into government service uh, at CISA and um, just recently back in the private sector and uh, at Next5 doing another uh, technology-based startup. Happy to be here. Terrific, great. Uh, Mark Montgomery. Thanks, uh, hi Suzanne, good to see you. Um, now, prior to the Cyberspace Learning Commission, I was with um, Senator John McCain on the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee as his policy director. I did that for uh, two years. And prior to that, I spent 32 years in the Navy. I uh, ran uh, nuclear reactors on aircraft carriers, commanded a destroyer and a destroyer squadron, and eventually a carrier strike group. Spent my most of my time as a flag officer uh, as our kind of lead war planner in Europe for Russia at UCOM, and then in the Pacific as the head of operations for about three years for US Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, excited to be here and uh, be here with uh, Tatiana and you both from my uh, cyber solarium past and present. Great to have you uh, here, Mark. Thank you. Tatiana. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, yeah, so I'm Tatiana Bolton. I'm the policy director for uh, cybersecurity and emerging threats at the R Street Institute. 
Uh, as Mark and Suzanne mentioned, uh, I was also on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission as a policy director and uh, focusing, focused on resilience and, um, uh, and other, other cybersecurity threats. I, before that, was at CISA um, focusing on cybersecurity and prior to that was at DOD. So excited to be here. Great. Well, we're, we're really pleased to have all of you here. Tatiana, I want to start with you. Um, I spoke this morning a bit about the ways to think about a risk-based approach to managing supply chains. Um, what's your sense about how we should be thinking about risk? I know you've, you've looked at this issue a lot in, in all of your various roles uh, that you've had. How should we be thinking about taking a risk-based approach to this threat landscape that we see? Thanks, yeah, and um, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be on the panel. Uh, I, I think that it's a, it's a broad discussion that we need to have about risk and the way that we think about it. We live in a hyper-connected world where everything from our personal computers to DOD weapon systems are targets for malicious actors. But it's a sad reality when it comes to cybersecurity. The US is woefully under-resourced and underprepared. And we've proved our vulnerability in the solar winds and subsequent hacks, but cybersecurity experts have been pleading with Washington to invest more in cybersecurity for years, as has the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So why are we so unprepared? Um, I think the problem isn't that there's not enough taxpayer money going towards our nation's defense. I think the problem is that the money currently exists and is being spent in a manner that prioritizes kinetic preparedness to cyber defense. Our defense budget reflects the threats of the past and the risk calculus of the past, and not the realities of what conflict looks like today. Perhaps most critically, where we see it trending in the future. Um, given the new risk environment, we have to question whether these investments are the best way to prioritize our defense dollars. And we need to think about cybersecurity as a part of our national defense. Existing thought focuses on a misaligned risk calculus in my view continuing our current patterns of defense spending, prioritizing funds for kinetic warfare preparedness over those uh, threats posed daily by cyber attacks, I think is misguided. At this point, we're better equipped to conduct a land war with China than we are to engage in a true cyber-based conflict. And you can argue that one is an existential threat and one is a nuisance, but I would also suggest to you that death by a thousand cuts can be just as deadly. Um, of course, it begs the question, where are our cybersecurity dollars currently being spent in the federal government? It's a surprisingly difficult question to answer. There's actually no public top line number telling us how much money is allocated and spent on cybersecurity. Even much of the lower level budgets are classified. Um, one of the reasons that the Solarium Commission recommended a Bureau of Cyber Statistics so that we could identify at least some of these baseline metrics on which to make our decisions. Um, so one of the things that I think is most important is that there have been some recent efforts in light of solar winds and other attacks to increase funding for cybersecurity, but they're not enough. Um, in particular, I think we need to see more funding and uh, based on the risk, uh, new risk calculus, move to resilience, cyber workforce, response and recovery efforts, particularly at CISA and state and local levels. Um, of course, to some extent, I'm being a little bit unfair to the system with things like nuclear weapons and tanks and the military, uh, the military orders acquires them, operates them. Um, cybersecurity is different. It relies on the public and the military and the private sector and the government. It's a lot more complex than obviously taking money from a pot labeled for the F-35 and porting it over to the Cyber Response and Recovery Fund, especially when some of that needs to indirectly result in something like shoring up private software supply chain in the state of Texas. So we need to think harder and more creatively about how to move funding where we need it to go in order to appropriately address risk and resource it tremendous into a tremendously challenging area that will determine our future security. Great. <clears throat> um, Mark, Tatiana, I make some interesting, an interesting point about the uh, priority that our funding at least seems uh, uh, allocation seem to reflect uh, a priority on kinetic uh, threats versus cyber threats. You certainly have a significant familiarity with both uh, threat areas and 
and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how we should be thinking about the threat landscape today. Certainly, um, China presents a very grave threat, uh, both in terms of uh, ICT, uh, as well as potential the potential for some kinetic conflict. So what, what's your sense overall of, of how we're doing on, on getting that balance right? And what are some of the key funding priorities that you uh, think we ought to be uh, thinking about? Uh, thanks, Suzanne. And I, and I agree uh, with what Tatiana said ahead of me. And uh, I would go on to say that, you know, the U.S. needs to spend a significant, the U.S. government needs to spend a significant amount more on, on cyber. And you could see that in the um, in the uh, in the uh, uh, bu budget in the additions to the COVID budget with the ARPA funding that added about 650 million to CISA. You can see that in the letter that the commission just put out on Monday, asking for CISA's 050 or 302B allocation to be increased nearly 20 percent. Now, I was happy to see the administration increase the budget 5 percent in their recommendation for FY22. I would note that that's. 5% is significantly less than the 16% that the administration was recommending for the rest of the non-DOD federal budget. And if, as the president says, it's a priority, it is unusual that you would prioritize something at one third the rate of the rest of the non-DOD budget. And so I really think they need to increase that number. The good news is the Congress can help them and we can get that number up and get CISA's budget up. I, I honestly believe long-term CISA's budget is gonna need to be significantly more than it is today. And, and that's natural. It's a new organization, three years old. It's natural that it would have a uh, a change in um, in budget, you know, a, 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 an increase in budgeting as it matured. Uh, but I suspect it may be after they've com uh, completed the force structure assessment that we assigned in last year's NDAA, the budget could be significantly higher. Well, one thing I would point out when you look specifically at ICT is, is the United States does need to recognize. So, so in the budget, I really think we need to do more on CISA. Um, one thing I would say about ICT is that is that we we do need to kind of recognize, kind of like we have in the in the kinetic world in the Western Pacific, that we do have a China problem. Um, you know, we have a growing dependency on parts made in China. Uh, China has um, effectively uh, mobilized its state-owned and state-influenced companies to grab really dominant positions in markets for many emerging technologies, including ICT equipment. Frankly, when we did our supply chain paper, we were talking about hardware, IT hardware. We, I know there are portions where we mentioned software, but our focus was the uh, IT hardware um, dominance that China had and the risk that it put us at. You know, I don't worry too much about my sneakers being made in China, but I do worry about you know the microchips for my El Raza missiles being made in China. And so we really did have this IT hardware thing. I think what we've seen from Solar Winds and the Microsoft Exchange is that we probably have a IT software issue as well that we need to get our hands around. So I do think there's a lot to, to, to unpack in that. And hopefully during this uh, during this uh, webinar, we'll, we'll get at some of it, but we really need to, to focus on, on how to strategically get at that Chinese challenge. Yeah, um, Brian, I, you're in a good position to, you know, sort of help articulate what might be some of the most important things that CISA would do with significantly increased funding. Um, I, you know, I know from my time there when it was still NPPD that one of the areas of urgent need was, frankly, for those business support functions, for those functions that that really provide essential support for those who are out on the front lines engaging uh, critical infrastructure every day, for example. Um, and yet, those are the kinds of things that Congress is loath to fund, uh, as you know. But um, but maybe you know if you can uh, give us a sense of the one or two you know most important priorities uh, where you could see additional funding for CISA going, and then um, I do want to you know get, talk with you about uh, what the impact is on our strategy um, of how we choose to define the problem. Uh, so, but let's start with the, with the funding issue. Yeah, thanks. And, and listen, I agree with everything that, that Tatiana and Mark have said, and I really appreciate the, the Solarium Commission's recommendations for and support for um, building CISA up. And CISA, you know, as a startup, at least in government terms, uh, it is smaller, 
it is under resourced. It is immature. You know, it doesn't have a lot of the mature business processes that, that more established parts of like the Department of Defense have. But it was designed uh, really well for the problems that we're facing today. It is placed uh, in a unique part of government where it's supposed to interface with the private sector and integrate uh, across the U.S. government, support state and local governments, and then interface with the IC and DOD. It's, it's such a hard job. Um, and it is, um, you know, I'd like to see it uh, double and then double again over the, over the next uh, four to six years. Um, you, you raise a really interesting point, Suzanne, about support functions. What we need in CISA are rock star cloud architects and agile software developers and elite threat hunters and these, these cybersecurity skills that um, are so hard to come by. Like all of those things that I just mentioned, which is what CISA needs to accomplish the mission, that's also the hottest parts of the tech sector right now. That's what Google wants. That's what uh, the NSA wants. That's what everybody wants are, are those people. Um, what we have to do at CISA is we have to build up a real human capital program, uh, the HR program, recruiting, training, retention, career laddering. Um, the last time that I had to brief the Congress on this was, was February of last year when we were presenting our budget. And I will never forget, I've forgotten certain lines of our budget. I've, some of those numbers I've forgotten, but the number that I have not forgotten was that our average time to hire a new employee at CISA at that time was 382.6 days. 382.6 days. So when we get additional dollars to go hire 200 new cyber defenders, cloud architects, and software developers, we can't wait, the country can't wait for it to take over a year. And so what I, what, what I really hope that we see is that you know, Eric Goldstein, the, the, the career guys, Chris Patera, Matt Hartman, the guys that are in CISA that need these people, I, I want to see us, um, DHS headquarters, OPM, OMB, and, and then CISA itself really support them from a, um, from a hiring perspective. Let's find the most creative and innovative ways that we can, because as you all know, the mission at CISA is amazing. It is a place that you would want to work if you had those skills, you just can't get in the door. And then I would pair that with acquisition as well. When you can't hire fast and you'll never be able to hire up to meet every surge like we've just had with solar winds or some of the new unique and really technical areas, that's, that's where we wanna rely on vendors and contractors. And, and it's just about as hard to bring them on too. And so really some, um, as, as you, you know, a lot of procurement is done at the DHS headquarters level, a small component like CISA, you know, certainly small relative to Customs and Border Protection or, or TSA or Coast Guard doesn't, you know, always get the, um, the attention that it needs. We need, um, you know, rapid reform on the acquisition side too, so that they can move to build things and buy things at the speed that technology is, is, is turning over. So rapid ATOs, you know, Air Force is doing its continuous ATO, um, novel types of contracts that allow um, the agility. So I think those are, there's some obvious scaling up of, of mission performance, but none of that money is going to meet the mission unless we can, uh, as Susanna is suggesting, you know, really um, support the organization. I think the, the last thing to the, to the thinking strategically about what we've all talked about, government spending isn't as big of an answer as you'd like it to be. And cyber spending is certainly not the answer. That's like spending a lot of money on, um, you know, crime scene investigation uh, or accident reconstruction is a better example. Uh, fixing defects in cars, the best, the best place to spend money is removing the defects at the design phase. We've got to find better ways to buy and build good information technology. To Mark's point, not by sourcing it from, from China or Asia, but, but the, the software that we have right now is brittle and insecure and not secure by design. And so until we demand better software, reward vendors for building better software, um, know how to even write better software and evaluate if that software was written well, 
uh, we'll, we'll never be able to spend enough cybersecurity funding to, to address the kinds of vulnerabilities that we continue to see over and over again from old software to modern cloud services. And I think that's just a, that's an ecosystem change that we need to, to, um, to figure out. I actually think the US government has a role in reshaping that ecosystem, whether it's software development best practices, uh, incentives for, for, for building secure software, and I hate, as a capitalist, I hate uh, penalties um, and I hate regulations, but there's got to be a responsibility of, of, of large IT vendors that have systemic vulnerabilities in their, in their software. So, uh, Mark, I know you'll, you, you, you may want to comment on some of the recommendations with regard to secure software and some of the, uh, in, in, particularly in our ICT uh, white paper around testing and clusters, et cetera. But before we get to that, and I'll, I'll come to you on that, um, Brian, I, I, the only thing I would add to your list of priorities for uh, increased funding for CISA is uh, the national cybersecurity functions, or na I'm sorry, national, national critical, critical functions. functions. Uh, work that yeah. the national risk management uh, folks are doing, because um, I do think at the end of the day, again, as the, you know, folks this morning or earlier today, I keep saying this morning, it was just earlier this afternoon, um, who heard me talk about uh, uh, doing this risk management approach. The work that they are doing to try to map and ide identify uh, national critical functions to focus us on the functions that are enabled by our, by our critical infrastructure, by our systems, assets, and networks from both a physical and cyber perspective, I think is ultimately so essential uh, to informing where we prioritize our resources, how we mitigate those consequences. So that would be the other place. But Brian, I, 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 I know that you uh, feel strongly about, you know, um, being careful about how we define the problem. Is it an IT problem or is it a cybersecurity problem? And what is the difference and why does that matter? Well, I mean, the difference is that at a certain point, you can't spend enough to secure something that cannot be secured. You, you know, we don't want to, as, as much as I just said, I'd like to see CISA's budget double a couple of times in the next four to six years. It, it can't double for the next 24 to six years, right? <laughs> like it, it, that's, that's not sustainable. Um, one of the intriguing, and I know that this is just a coincidence, but it's an intriguing coincidence, is that the amount of technology modernization funds is about the same as the amount of cybersecurity funds. So I would argue that the one-to-one -one ratio is probably not the ratio that we want. It's more like a 10 or a hundred to one ratio of let's move away from old software that is hard to secure because it's no longer patched or supported. Let's invest in secure cloud architectures provably secure cloud implementations. Let's encourage our software vendors uh, through acquisition, by the way, that is the way that we uh, encourage things is by spending money on things that are inherently more secure. I'd really love as an engineer, I'd love to see less cybersecurity spending because we don't need to spend as much because our software is secure. Now that's a that's an, a, not an entirely realistic uh, goal for um, the, the current state of things, but our you know, our long-term strategy cannot be to just get better and better at cyber defense or better and better at cyber deterrence. We've got to also have economic incentives for building good software, not software that is so easy to exploit. We have had so, these vulnerabilities that you're going down. So many of them require so little sophistication of the adversary. Um, that, that again, you can't cyber spend your way out of it. We've, we've just got to have better software. Yeah, so Mark, you uh, correctly noted that we really um, put most of the emphasis on our on our ICT supply chain paper, at least on, on kind of the hardware supply chain. Um, but we did have some recommendations uh, for ways in which we might be able to create or, or help promote more secure software. Do you want to talk about those a little bit? But I agree. Um, and, and first, I would say on the tech modernization versus cybersecurity, I, I'm going to stick. I won't go quite to the 100 to 1, but I'll stick with 10 to 1. Um, 
And I think that's about right. You know, we do need to spend about between eight businesses and the government between eight and 12% of every IT dollar needs to be on cybersecurity. And depending on what your business model is and what you're doing. And uh, we have to be, I'll be honest though, the government generally spends less than that. And certainly in the private sector, outside of banking, I think that they they frequently spend less than that. And, and, and one thing I'll mention on that is the tech modernization fund, this could be a very interesting year because I looked back over the last four years, you know, 187, $175 million appropriated, 87 million um, author, 87 million given out in grants. And suddenly it's going to grow to, you know, it was 1.1 billion. Now it's 1.5 billion. I mean, it, you know, I would say the government generally doesn't do well when they spend 20 times as much money the next year as they did the previous year on anything. And, you know, I put that in DOD, the IC, Treasury, Education, wherever. It's nearly impossible to increase your funding 2,000% and then have the word say, and I did it efficiently afterwards. So I hope that we can really get this right. And I also hope we get the rule sets right on that on tech modernization, it, if it continues to be, you pay us back all the money, then the agencies that just don't, that, that don't prioritize cybersecurity won't prioritize cybersecurity with the tech modernization fund available, unless humiliated or embarrassed or reputationally forced into it. You know, you wanna make it so that if you come up with a good plan, you're rewarded with some defrayed cost by, you know, by the Congress or by uh, whoever, the, the board that administers the tech modernization fund. Um, on the ITC software, you're right. I think we, we have some good recommendations on clustering and on, and um, I think we also recognize that, um, that you know, and we'll see this more. We're doing a white paper on what federal network IT security might need to be three to five years from now. And you'll see us starting to talk about, I'm, I'm uncomfortable saying zero trust because I think sometimes that means I dropped the grenade into the existing software and that, or network and built a new one. And if I know something the government can't afford to do, it's build the rebuild the .gov. But what we can begin to do is build a more trustworthy system or a less trusting system that gives you a more trustworthy result. So we have to find those softwares that we can bring in. And I think CISA needs to manage this, particularly when you say there's 180, 102 federal departments and agencies out there, maybe 25 can follow FISMA without falling off the train track. Those other 78 agencies need to follow completely the direction of CISA. And they have to get their services through CISA on a, on a pass through, whether it's Kismo or another mechanism, I don't care. And how we get that software in there, how we bring it in, how we push it, how we, uh, how we push those to the federal agency is gonna be critical, but it has to be an environment that says, I don't trust the things around, I'm an untrusting environment that gives me a more credible and trustworthy product. And I know there's, I can't figure out the acronym for that yet. And the CSE Commission is terrible acronyms. We came up with SICKY. SICKY. So I just want to be careful, but we do need to come with zero trust makes me nervous every time I hear a federal, someone close to federal acquisition say it or an appropriator, because I think it presumes, it presumes a level of dropping the grenade that none of us are willing to pay for the, the cleanup. So I, I know I'm a little bit moving around the target there, but that's how I look at this. Yeah, and I think an important, really important part of the of what you've articulated in terms of um, learning to operate in an environment where we uh, don't depend on trusting our our network uh, is really important. And an imp really important aspect of that again is that means, among other things, that we need to assume a successful. But you know that that malicious cyber activity will be successful as we do our planning, um, and it puts a great emphasis on mitigating the consequences and finding those analog ways, if you will, those paper ballots to restore trust in untrusted election uh, systems, for example. Um, you know that that we we really need to bring that much more into our cyber conversations, and it's one of the reasons I think CISA uh, is such a terrific organization because it retained the physical uh, infrastructure security mission as well as the cyber mission. And, and it's only by taking that holistic approach that we're gonna be able to uh, look at uh, really how we understand the risks and mitigate them um, across the board. Um, but you mentioned it, Siki, uh, systemically important critical infrastructure. And, uh, and, and uh, the commission looked at that as one of the most important ways that we can think about both prioritizing 
as we look at risks uh, and prioritizing the allocation of federal resources and assistance. So do you want to talk for a minute uh, for folks who may not be as familiar with the SICI notion, Mark? Sure. So, you know, SICI and We'll stick with that acronym. It, it was identifying the companies um, that play a vital function in the U.S. economy, our national security, our public health and safety. You re referred to it earlier as our critical functions. You know, this is not, uh, you know, Fred's dry cleaner. This is Dominion Power. If you're sitting there in Northern Virginia, they 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 support our national security, economic security, public health. And the idea is the sicky companies would be required. They would be required to to both have burdens, maintain a higher level of security. Uh, for one, and and then receive benefits, and uh, and so the idea is they they be required to report all cyber incidents to the federal government with very rapid time time frames, not the kind that you see associated with data breach, and uh, they would shoulder additional security burdens if they particularly if they weren't in a heavily regulated industry already, like like say banking or or energy, and in return these companies would benefit from direct intelligence support from the U.S. intelligence community, which would be very hard to push through Congress, and then probably even higher harder liability protection for such incidents if they remain in compliance with the requirements of SICI. You know, the, the, the way we wrote this provision is it's to identify, protect, and defend the most critical of the critical companies that have targeted and exploited you know, by China, by Russia, other strategic adversaries, they could produce really catastrophic consequences on the on the economy. But it's got to be a package deal. You know, we work with some congressional committees in there, and they're looking pretty comfortable stripping off liability or stripping off the intelligence support. And you go to other ones and they want to strip down the regulatory. You can't do it. It's got to be a benefits and burdens. It will make Section 9 of Executive Order 13636 a reality. It, it was always hamstrung by the lack of legislative backing with the liability protection. I think if you bring this, we have to do it. And there's a growing recognition of the value of the critical infrastructure, the challenge to our industry, and the idea that no company should be able to hold off a Russian or Chinese APT on their own. It's just not realistic. They need to be in a better collaborative environment with, uh, with the US government. And after 23 years of talking about it, since PDD 63 and the 2000 National Infrastructure Assurance Plan, we really need to move in to effective operational collaboration you know, one of the reasons I really like Chris Inglis as National Cyber Director is I think he comes with that operational collaboration environment. That is an advantage for being at NSA. There's been a little bit of that, but there's a big advantage for him being not at NSA for the last six years and able to bring that private sector viewpoint of, of what's really required. So a little bit extra there, but I, I think SICKI is going to be really important, hopefully this legislative cycle. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I, I agree. And you know, I always used to say when, you know, of course, when we were at DHS, we love all our children equally, you know, all critical infrastructure is important. And we understand that uh, what seems like a small, insignificant HVAC vendor can be a really important vector to into something that that uh, can have a real impact. Um, so we do need to keep that in mind. But this idea that once you've identified national critical functions and mapped them, that you can then identify the critical entities that just uh, if, if, if disrupted would uh, have that catastrophic impact on those critical functions. Yeah, I don't see how you can't uh, right, uh, recognize that, that now we need to do everything we can to make sure that that doesn't happen. And that means um, benefits and burdens, as you say. Um, Edward, one of the uh, Areas that you know, some of the areas that you've touched upon and and, and spend a lot of time looking at um, might fall into this uh, category, right? Of systemically important critical infrastructure, or at least critically important data, uh, and yet maybe doesn't get enough attention. Do you want to uh, touch a bit on on you, you on the um, importance of? For example, data around um, you know bio uh, uh, biological data. Sure. No. So, I mean, um, I guess I'm going to be adding another layer of complexity to the challenges that was already have already been discussed. Uh, but from a from a biotech standpoint, um, it, you know, the fact that we're meeting like this, you know, virtually because we're we're still in the throes of a pandemic. Bear in mind that um, we got a vaccine in record time based on data, right? We went, we translated the DNA sequence of the virus, and with in shorter in a matter of months, both Pfizer and Moderna were able to turn out these mRNA-based vaccines, which um, has been a godsend. But it really highlights how 
where you mentioned ICT, it's been the foundation where biotech has really been able to grow in leaps and bounds and translate the digital realm into the physical realm where you're seeing a convergence between bio and cyber, which now has different security ramifications that I don't think we're really considering. And if anything, the solar winds incident really highlights um, the greater vulnerability from when you put a bio perspective on it. So just to kind of give you an example, you know, much like the vaccines, it's all about the data and data in of itself becomes a, a critical infrastructure, right? So in the very near future, your genetics, right? Your social media feeds, which are timed, date stamped and geotagged, your smart home with a smart thermostat, smart refrigerators that track your diet, all of that information is gonna be combined and aggregated and will complete your profile. And based on that, will dictate what kind of health treatment should you be provided? What kind of pharmaceuticals should you be prescribed? So it ultimately is gonna have some sort of impact on individuals as patients or as consumers. And in that, it highlights a really important vulnerability that the, many of these data sets are born in the open, right? For example, your DNA sequence is not even covered by HIPAA. Um, just to give you an idea, there's the, the privacy protections just don't exist right now. But as soon as you aggregate the open source data, suddenly it, ha it becomes a commodity. It has value. And our current cybersecurity paradigm doesn't address that new environment where cybersecurity is protecting financial, confidential, classified, or proprietary data. Well, the, the, the very near future is whoever generates the largest, most diverse data sets are going to be able to engineer or design new IP. So if you think about who has access to all the data, well, I hate to say it, but one of the biggest players out there right now is China. And it isn't necessarily just through cyber intrusions and theft. Um, through you know, using the system to their advantage, they've invested, acquired, or merged with companies both in the US and abroad that have access to um, our data, whether it be providing clinical services or genetic testing for genealogy studies or among other different things. We don't think about it. It's not, it's not a, uh, a cyber hack. It's a, it's a contract um, issue because we don't understand the broader perspective, the broader context of what will be a security vulnerability. And what that also means is that we have a window of opportunity today to get this right. Because if we don't start putting in, um, and I guess the, a bio version of DevSecOps, you know, engineering security on the front end, then the, the nightmare scenario is not what we're losing today, Right, because the data in residence today may not mean all that much, but over time, as they accumulate more, as they develop the tools, whether it be quantum computing or true AI, and they can turn that loose on the data which they have, which by the way, we don't have any access to. There is no data access reciprocity, which gives them a tremendous advantage that I don't think we are really truly um, understanding. But that will mean potentially co-opting future market share, future business model, future job opportunities, which will all be translated to over there. And from, a, from that economic impact will translate very quickly as a national security threat. And we need to look at that today and understanding what does data security or looking at it, uh, data security as a life cycle, right? Identifying potentially valuable data. How do we transmit it? How do we store it? How do we access it? How do we analyze it? And then translate into actual products and all the infrastructure that makes, that supports all of that every single step of the process of that life cycle has their own inherent security challenges and needs. But we are still not able to, well, you mentioned risk, assess risk and, and apply security holistically. So from a CISA standpoint, I feel for uh, DHS because what bio highlights is that data is gonna be hugely important, not only in health, but in agriculture. So if you think about farmers using satellite and drone imagery data to help improve crop yield, or energy production in bio for renewable sources, which is very important for this administration, um, and manufacturing materials, it's all about the data. And we are not looking at how do we secure our, not the data for today, but especially for our future. And I, I hate to say it, but I, I submit that I don't think cybersecurity considerations are being talked about that. And from a CISA standpoint, the bio perspective showcases that there's bio in each of the, multi, each of the critical uh, infrastructure sectors, but it also suddenly becomes a sector unto itself because of the convergence of the technology of the data and how it might be translated. And that, that kind of ecosystem will make security even that much more challenging.
Um, so I, I mean, that's a lot to unpack, but I'm, I'm kind of hoping that I, I kind of laid out what's, what, what we're currently facing, what that might translate into. It's, um, it's fascinating, Edward, and, and really quite frightening. Uh, you say we, we have a window of opportunity. It sounds to me like we're way behind. Uh, that window is rapidly closing. Uh, and uh, so, you know, appreciate your thoughts that you've shared with us already about where we might go with that. Um, the kinds of steps that we could be taking. It does seem to me that it's uh, an issue in addition to um, what happens with massive amounts of data uh, and the way it can fuel AI and other kinds of technological leaps, um, but also the integrity of that data as, as we depend, grow increasingly dependent upon it in increasingly complex ways that, that resemble a black box. So fascinating stuff. Tatiana, um, we've only got a few minutes left, but I wanted to come back to you um, to kind of uh, you know, continue this move from, from the threat landscape to what, what can we be doing? What are the most important things that, that we, we need to be doing right now uh, to try to get out ahead of and deal with the threat landscape that we see? Uh, so I think that um, I want to go back to something Brian said about the workforce um, and looking at some of these underlying base level issues that we continue to have in cybersecurity. Or, uh, the, the workforce is absolutely one of the main issues there. Um, if we don't have the people to do the work we need done, right now we have something like 530,000 open positions in cybersecurity that aren't filled and that's that's growing every year. Um, this, the Solarium, uh, we put out a workforce report which, which sort of lays out some of the solutions there. Um, we also need to sort of focus more on China and the supply chain. Um, right, we're trying to do that with the supply, uh, the secure and competitive markets initiative, um, because we want to take a look at uh, a, co a cohesive strategy for how to address the China problem. We need to look at how we're looking at investing, how we're looking at manufacturing, how we're looking at security, uh, what it looks like in the military space, and all of that is a cohesive picture. China has a very clear vision for what their strategy is. They've laid out a five-year plan. They have a, a concept, right? They're like to Ed's point, they're they are taking all of this, looking at it 20 years down the road. How am I going to use this data? We need a similar strategic vision. I don't think that right now, and I think the administra last administration was particularly um, guilty of this, uh, laid out their tactics in alignment with a, a clear strategy. We couldn't articulate what our goal was, right? We couldn't say, are we trying to build up our own resilience? or are we trying to uh, affect Chinese behavior? I think we need to be very clear about that. Um, and so I think sort of partnering with some of that as well as the, uh, uh, the cyber statistics, I think uh, trying to um, get the Bureau of Cyber Statistics up and running, the SICKY the um, uh, moniker, I think we need to get all of these things working together at the base level and address some of those bigger issues. And I think from that, build out the strong, stronger cybersecurity. Great. Well, I, I could continue this conversation all afternoon because uh, you all have such interesting insights to share, but I know that we are out of time. And since we are the last panel, we, we uh, it, it will either end or people will simply drop off and we'll just be talking to ourselves. So um, I'm going to uh, end it there. Uh, thank all of you for your wonderful insights and um, give it back to uh, your host, Elizabeth Jimenez. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, Thank Suzanne. You. That was incredible. Thank you so much, panelists.